Okay guys, what I want to do now is I want to cover oxygen sensors. So let's take a look at this oxygen sensor. So the oxygen sensor comprises an upper housing. This is like a metal sleeve that the wires go in. And this has an atmospheric vent in it, either in the metal sleeve or the oxygen comes straight down the actual wire. And the oxygen is going to come down into the inner atmospheric cell. So I have an an inner platinum plate and I have an outer platinum plate and in between the platinum plates I have a zirconium material. On the outer side I have a protective magnesium spinel and we'll talk about that in a minute and then I have a outer dampener that's the piece with louvers in it and that dampens the air pulsation as it comes out the engine so it, it's got one even pressure across the sensor so it will work correctly. And then I have a heater and this heater is like a glow plug. It's a ceramic heater just like a glow plug and it's going to heat this inner cell up. The inner platinum plate needs to be kept above 575 degrees Fahrenheit or it doesn't work. So when these sensors are not in the exhaust manifold itself like right up by the heat of the engine leaving if these are down a ways, this heater has to work before this sensor is going to be active and accurate. And then on the inner plate, this is the positive plate, so I have the positive lead connected here. And these are graphite bonds, but I also have a lead that connects off of here. So this is the positive lead, positive wire. And the outer platinum plate, the exhaust side, is the negative plate and it's connected to the neg negative wire. And then I have the threads that hold this into the exhaust manifold. So that's the basic parts of this sensor. Now let's talk about how it really works. Oxygen comes down from the atmosphere into the atmospheric chamber. The heater heats this so it's above 575 degrees. And really 575 degrees is just where it starts to work. But we really want this sensor about 800 degrees or hotter to make it really work and have it quick. So this is going to be hot. Oxygen comes down. And oxygen, an oxygen molecule is two oxygens. They're diatomically connected together. And what happens is when they get on this plate, the platinum plate, the platinum allows the oxygen to break apart at a much lower temperature. What's a much lower temperature? Well, just in the atmosphere, if I was going to try to break oxygen apart, it would need to be hotter than 1,850 degrees Fahrenheit. But it'll break apart on the platinum at 575 degrees. It'll start to break apart. So it lowers the amount of energy to break apart. That's what a catalytic reaction is. It's lowering the energy to break this or have a chemical reaction occur but no part of the platinum is consumed or used in this reaction. So the oxygen comes down as an oxygen molecule, gets on the platinum, and breaks apart into oxygen ions. Now, a covalent bond, when the oxygens are connected together, they use a covalent bond. That means they're sharing an electron. So both oxygen atoms by themselves are deficient in electrons. But when they connect together, they fill whole because they're sharing an electron. But when you break them apart, they need to take on electrons because they're deficient. So they take on an electron from the outer plate. Each oxygen ion, when it breaks apart, when an oxygen molecule breaks apart on the plate, it becomes an oxygen ion. And it's deficient in electron. So it immediately, each atom takes on two electrons from the plate. And then the zirconium material, the only thing that can go through zirconium is an oxygen ion. An oxygen molecule where two oxygens are connected together, well, they can't go through the zirconium. But when they break apart, now the oxygen can migrate across this, this zirconium. And the zirconium is a crystal lattice. Now, zirconium by itself can't be used in a sensor because it's, as it heats up, it starts to have so many changes in the way that the crystallization happens that when it cools down, it cracks. And if it cracks, then the oxygen gas will get into the inner cell 
and this, this sensor wouldn't work anymore. So we have to do something to keep that from happening. So we add yttria, which is a stabilizer. Now the yttria stabilizes the, the crystal lattice structure so it doesn't have so much chain, so it doesn't crack. But it also does one other thing. It adds holes. So the oxygen jumps from hole to hole to hole to move across to the outer plate. Now what's happening is the oxygen on the inside wants to get to the outside to attach to hydrogen. The biggest pull for the oxygen is the hydrogen. So an oxygen ion gets pulled across and it gets on this outer plate and then it connects to a couple of hydrogens and it becomes H2O, water. Now the oxygen wants to attach to the hydrogen and the hydrogen wants to attach to the oxygen. And once it's water, it's a very stable molecule. And then it leaves an exhaust trace in the exhaust. And the carbon is, or the oxygen is also pulled across to carbon. And then I have two oxygens attached to a carbon, and I have carbon dioxide, another one of the exhaust gases. So there's two main constituents pulling the oxygen across the zirconium boundary. And that's mainly carbon is the main pull, but carbon also has a pull. So if I have hydrogen out here, one of the oxygen ions moves across the zirconium boundary, gets on this outer plate, this outer platinum plate, and then it reattaches to the hydrogen, and the two electrons it pulled from the inner plate it leaves them on the outer plate when it attaches to the hydrogen. It also leaves the electrons when it attaches to a carbon. So now I'm moving electrons from the inner plate to the outer plate and I make a charge differential and that's what you read when you read that your oxygen sensor is making a volt output in the rich. That's because I have a lot of hydrogen and carbon so I have a lot of oxygen being pulled across the zirconium to get to the hydrogen and carbon on the outside of the plate. It takes, it takes electrons from the inner plate and moves them across to the outer plate and it leaves these electrons on the outer plate. And I have the charge differential between the inner and outer plate and that's the voltage that I'm reading. So this oxygen sensor, anything above 0.8 volts is rich and anything below 0.2 volts is lean. The engineers know this, and everything between 0.2 and 0.8 is stoichiometric. So the engineer knows that as long as I stay between 0.2 and 0.8 volts, I'm stoked. So they use this as a switch, so they get the preturbulations moving from the oxygen sensor. But really what that is, is that's, they're just switching it, and they're using short-term trim to make this change. So when this starts to go rich, they drive the short-term low low, and then when it starts to go down, they drive it high. So the short-term trim, fuel trim is what's actually what this is reading. Remember that sensors only read physical quantity. So what this sensor is really reading is a physical quantity of the hydrogen and carbon. And hydrocarbons are what we're burning. That's our fuel stock. So we're burning hydrocarbons and when I, when I don't completely burn all the hydrogen and carbon because I'm, they, I'm too rich and I have too much hydrogen and carbon, that hydrogen and carbon comes down to the outside of this plate and it has an affinity or the oxygen is pulled to the hydrogen to recombine with the hydrogen. So I have a single oxygen reattaching to hydro, hydrogen, two hydrogens, and I take a oxygen H2O, and I have water, but it's a real attractive pull. The, the poles here are immense because I've got a chemical attraction, but when this is in the lean and all i got is oxygen out here, oxygen's not attracted to oxygen, so the oxygen doesn't migrate through the zirconium dioxide, so I'm not moving electrons from this plate to this plate, and so the plates become, they don't, there's not much charge differential, so I'm below two-tenths of a volt. I don't make much voltage in the lean. So if I've got a lot of oxygen on the outside and not much, not much hydrogen and carbon, I have no affinity to pull the oxygen across this zirconium boundary, so I'm not moving electrons. So I don't, take, I don't 
these plates stay more balanced. So they, they're not a lot of charge differential because I'm not moving a lot of oxygen. The richer it is, the more oxygen is going to be moved across or pulled across the zirconium, the zirconium boundary. And these electrons are going to have a charge differential on the plate. And that's what we're reading. And then on this outer plate, I have this red boundary, which is a magnesium alumina magnesium spinel. So I can have different kinds of alumina. Aluminum is, aluminum is, char is heated in the presence of water, and it makes alumina. And there's alpha, beta, theta. And each one of these are, have different porosities. But I make this a very porous material where the molecules can move right through it. But this boundary protects this plate, this outer plate, from being eroded from the exhaust gases, which are really corrosive. So in the early oxygen sensors, like single wire oxygen sensors, they didn't have this, this alumina spinel on here. And so the outer plate would degrade in 50,000 miles. And they knew that, so they had a light come on on the dash of the car saying oxygen sensor at 50,000 miles because they knew that the plate would be deteriorated and it couldn't work correctly. Later oxygen sensors have spinel, and now with this protective material, these will go well past 100,000 working quite well and accurate. So the spinel made a huge difference to these oxygen sensors' life. So the oxygen sensor that we're covering thus far is a four-wire sensor with the heater. Now, this four-wire sensor is considered, when they first made it, it was considered a wide range air fuel sensor because it will read 11 to 1 in the rich from 17 to 1 in the lean. And that is quite a range. That's far more than just stoke. And a lot of that happened because the heater is in here. Now when the heater turns on, it'll pull close to two amps when it's cold, but once it's pulsing or it's on, it pulls about an amp. Now when they first started to have these heaters, they just turned that heater all the way on, and if I, since this is exposed to atmosphere, I could get water in here, and it would get it so hot that I could steam flash the water, and I could crack the zirconium. So what you'll see in later vehicles is they'll start to duty cycle this sensor and they'll slowly heat it up so you don't steam burst the, the zirconium dioxide. Now in, lay, in earlier sensors, in earlier sensors, there was one and two wire sensors and these were narrow band sensors or considered narrow band. They would really just say where Stoke was but they couldn't go from 11 to 1 to 17 to 1. That's a much later four-wire sensor design like we're looking at here. Now in a one-wire design, these threads that are over here that hold it into the exhaust manifold were the ground. So I had one wire coming in to be on the positive plate, and then I'd read the negative plate with the threads. Now what that problem is, is the threads start to get all rusted and debris gets on them. And we all know what the rust on the exhaust does. And that can give me a voltage drop. And if this sensor can only make 0.8 tenths of a volt or so, and I have a 2 tenths drop, I just lost a quarter of the scale of this sensor. So it's totally out of calibration. So the engineers were struggling with keeping the vehicles running within the right fuel band because I was having problems with the threads and getting the ground. So the first thing they tried is they went in, they got a two-wire sensor, and they took one of the wires, they had a redundant ground. Rather than using these ground, this ground on the threads, they had an actual ground that came down with two wires, and it grounded like this. There's still no ceramic heater in it, but it, it at least got rid of the voltage drops that were occurring from the manifold, from the ground on the manifold, going through the block, going all the way back to the computer and getting a tenth or two of a volt. And guys, on any oxygen sensor, a tenth or two of a volt, that's too much to have. It'll take the calibration and it drifts it. So then you're not in fuel control. So always be very aware 
that in, you're not allowed any kind of drops on an O2 sensor. When you're dealing with, with voltage drops, always look at what, what kind of voltage you're dealing with before you can assign how much drop you're expecting. I mean, this isn't like powers and grounds to where we have these numbers that I've been giving you all class. This is, this is you've got to think about what you're testing, right? This is about thinking about things, guys. The other thing that will take this out of calibration is if I do anything to impair the oxygen coming into the inner cell. A lot of times I've seen the outside of these sensors get covered in oil or antifreeze and it blocks the port either whether it's in the connector and the wire and it's coming down the wire or it's coming through the metal sleeve here there's a little hole. Any way that I, I don't allow enough oxygen to come into this chamber, this sensor will drift its calibration and then it can't keep accurate fuel control. In order to see if this is an accuracy or not, if it's calibrated or it's drift its calibration, a five gas analyzer is absolutely the best tool to see. You check for a lambda of one. If you have a lambda of one coming out the tailpipe and you have pre-turbulations out of here that are shifting between 0.2 and 0.8, the sensor's in calibration. I don't really know any other way that's accurate to do that other than I check the pre-turbulations and they're moving between 0.2 and 0.8 and a gas, analyzer, a gas analyzer says I have a lambda of 1. These are very accurate and this is the way to test these sensors. Okay, I think I've pretty much covered that sensor. Are there any questions? Excellent.